Good evening. My name is Bill Cahoy, and I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Seminary here at St. John's. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Diekman Lecture. I'd like to say just a few words about the namesake of this lecture, Father Godfrey Diekman, as prelude to the main attraction, which is the lecture itself. Now, some of you knew Father Godfrey personally, and many more knew him or know him by reputation. He died in 2002, a monk of the Abbey here, uh, at the age of 93. Vital pretty much right up till the end, uh, after a life that was uh, long, but also full and energetic. Godfrey may be the only person on the planet who is present at both a Hitler-Nuremberg rally and marched in the Selma Civil Rights March. Just odd to think of that combination. He carried a sign, Liturgist for Justice. As those of you who knew him can attest, Godfrey was a man of great energy and enthusiasm about almost everything. He was especially enthusiastic about teaching theology. And he saw the goal of his teaching as sharing not only his knowledge, but his love of Christ, the living God with us. He was particularly passionate about the Second Vatican Council, the 50th anniversary of which we are beginning to celebrate this year. Father Godfrey was editor, after the death of Father Virgil Michael, of the journal Arate Fratres, which became worship and is still being published uh, vibrantly here at St. John's. He was heavily involved in the rich historical and theological thinking about liturgy that went on in those decades prior to the council. He brought some of that back with him from Europe when he was studying. And much of that thinking about liturgy went through this place and that journal. Uh, people and ideas came through St. John's and the conversation was facilitated and sent back out so that when the council came, Godfrey was invited to be a peritus or an official advisor to the council. This gave him access to and input on the thinking that shaped the council documents. In every chance he got, he would tell us how the key to the whole council, the document that opened up the thinking of the bishops, was the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sancro Sacnum Concilium. And the story got better every time he told it. We gather here tonight to remember and to celebrate Godfrey and his work, but far more importantly, to perpetuate his legacy. We would hardly honor Godfrey if we remembered him only by looking back to the past, recent or ancient, and that includes his own, with merely antiquarian interests, or if we sought out the past for fear of the present. That's not Godfrey. Now, his passion was that we be fed by the ancient sources, that we understand them well, so that we might be renewed and reborn by them to move boldly into the future, God's future and ours, faithfully and fearlessly. The spirit of the living God does not work only in the past, it's active here and now. We need to learn to recognize that spirit and have the courage to follow where it leads us. This is the heritage of Father Godfrey Diekman. It's the heritage of St. John's. It's a heritage that it is our task to keep alive for the good of the whole church. That's the heritage we teach and invite our students to become part of in the School of Theology and Seminary. Now to help us keep that heritage alive, we've established this Godfrey Diekman lecture in Patristics and Liturgy. I'd like to offer a special thank you to the donors, large and small, who have made it possible for us to have this lecture and related activities. A number of them are with us tonight, so thank you. Our hope is that we will someday have a chair that will enable us to continue in yet another way the work of Father Godfrey and the heritage of St. John's, both in liturgical renewal and patristics, but all in service of the church. Certainly, if any of you would like to help us make that dream come true, let me know. It's a great way to leave a legacy of hope for generations to come. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kim Belter, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Kim. Hello. 
Rita comes to us tonight from Mount Vernon, New York, where she lives with her husband. Rita received her MDiv from Yale Divinity School in 1983. Since that time, she's worked for the Catholic Church as a parish liturgy director, a diocesan director of adult initiation, and an independent writer, teacher, and speaker across the United States. In addition to working with the North American Forum on the Catechumenate, Rita also serves on the advisory board of the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and teaches in their summer seminar for congregational leaders. Rita is the author of several books, including Source Books for Sundays and Seasons, On the Right of Election, and most recently, Liturgy Sacrosanctum Concilium, for which she won a Catholic Press Association Award. She co-authored the 18-volume series Foundations in Faith, She's a frequent contributor to Commonweal, America, Worship, and other journals. Her 2009 article in Commonweal on the Exultet won a Best of the Christian Press Award from the Associated Church Press. She is closer to home, a contributor and editorial board member of our Pray Tell blog, and she contributes also frequently to liturgical presses Give Us This Day. Please join me in thanking Rita Ferroni for bringing her vision of unity. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, everyone, for that warm welcome. Because we stand together here at the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council, I thought I would begin with a few remarks about Vatican II to frame the question of Catholic unity and the liturgy today. And in order to begin to talk about Vatican II, I thought it would be well to talk a little bit about continuity and change, because no matter where we are in our opinions about the Council, it will in some way engage how we feel about continuity and how we feel about change. So I'd like to suggest a few ways to enter into this. The first is this old house. Did anybody ever watch that television program? Have any of you actually rehabbed or renovated a house? Maybe if you have, you know that if you do it really well, someone can come in after you've renovated and they look at it and say, it looks like a new house. But you know, it's the same house. I mean, you can even move walls and put doors in where they were. You can't move structural walls, but you can do a great many things that make it look like it is new and yet, it is the same house. My husband and I just bought an apartment last year, last summer, in a 1928 apartment building in Mount Vernon. And one of the reasons we love it is that it's old. But we also love it because uh, the people who owned it before us had updated it so we have all of the uh, lighting is the right, uh, the, 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 the uh, outlets are in the right places, the electrical outlets and the lighting is beautiful and the kitchen has new appliances and all of these things. We love it because it's old, but actually if it were exactly the same as it was in 1928, it would be very hard to live in the place today. So the original beauty of something that's old does require it to be changed in order to remain the same. Is it the same house? Yeah, it's the same house. But you can understand why some people would say, you know, it's an entirely new house. Let's go a little deeper. I've taken first a physical example. I'd like to consider with you a more spiritual example, the idea of conversion. Perhaps you've known someone to under, undergo a conversion, or maybe you've undergone a conversion yourself, and if so, maybe this will make sense to you. I want to present you a little definition of conversion that I received from a religious educator friend of mine. And here it is. I experience or take part in a community event powerful enough to make my previous images start to disintegrate. They become strange and distant. I am no longer at ease with what I do or how I do it. 
I begin to respond to other images, stories, or values that are presented to me, and I take on new images of God, neighbor, and self. I start to act out of these images within a new community of meaning. Old ways of doing things become strange and distant. We gain new images of God, neighbor, and self, and begin to act out of those new images in a new community of being. So if you think of someone who's really undergone a conversion and people say, oh, she's like a new person. She always used to be so grumpy, now she's really a happy person. Or she was never one to really take a great interest in other people, and now she can't get enough of being of service or doing something to help someone else. That person's life is still one life, and yet something has changed, and she will act differently as a result. Now the church at Vatican II, it seems to me, is a church that underwent a conversion. Fifty years ago, something profound happened. Now, truth to tell, the assembled leaders did not come to found that the majority was ready to give birth to new images of God, community, and self, and thereby to renew the church. You know, before they had the Second Vatican Council, they sent out a questionnaire to all the bishops, very modern thing to do, you know. And so many of them didn't know what a council would do. Their only models were historical models uh, that were very far in the past. And so they wrote in lists of anathemas they hoped to achieve at the council. You know, they, it, it was interesting. It's interesting to read all the things they thought it would be a nice opportunity to condemn communism and secularism and you know, a lot of isms, so we're going to be condemned. And then they'd go home. But when they got, came together, something else happened. And there were new images that came to the fore. And a new self rose up that was already in the persons who are there, but needed them to be together for that experience to make something new happen. A third way of looking at continuity and change is the idea of paradigm shift. How many of you are familiar with this? You've heard of paradigm shift, yeah. It's something that's been around a while. It's a pattern, a paradigm is a pattern or a way of seeing things as a whole so that the pieces are organized within a pattern that makes up the way things are in our perceptions and in our world. Thomas Kuhn in, 1962 wrote a book, a very famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he talked about how in uh, sciences, their uh, progress in science was not a matter of just adding more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge, but that it was a factor of a paradigm shift which would change the way science was done from filling out one paradigm to a kind of quantum leap to another paradigm, and then the regular science was filling out the implications of the new paradigm that was, uh, was proposed and presented. So if you think about this, it, ordinary science works this out all the time, but a paradigm shift is a very rare occasion, happens very rarely. So if you think, for example, so many centuries, people thought that the Earth was flat. And then at a certain point, this idea that the Earth was round required you to work out a lot of other things in a different way because you had a different paradigm that you were working out of. Or Newtonian physics versus uh, the physics that was ushered in by the insights of Albert Einstein. Uh, or even if you look back farther in history, Aristotle, his physics are not bad Newton. He's just different. It's a different paradigm. Um, and just it, this idea of paradigm shift has been applied to the way people interact with one another, too, on the uh, personal and interpersonal and social realms as well. I'll tell you a couple of stories that would kind of illustrate how this works. It was a dark and stormy night, and a ship was sailing on the ocean, and a great fog is settling on the water. It's very hard to see. There's a storm, it's a difficult uh, situation, but the captain is on the brow of the ship and sees a light in the distance. It's another ship, and it's coming straight at 
the ship that, is, that he is sailing on. So he radios ahead and says his coordinates and says, change course 25 degrees to the starboard. We will change course as well and we can avoid a collision. There is a dangerous situation ahead. And the answer comes back, impossible. You must change course. The captain is taken aback at this and he radios again and says, I don't think you understand. We are headed for a direct collision. If we don't both move, there will be a very grave danger. You must move in this direction and we will also move in that direction. The answer comes back, impossible. You must change course. Finally, the captain is outraged. What is this all about? And radios a third time said, who do you think you're talking to? I am the captain of this ship. And the answer comes back, and I am a lighthouse. <laughs> Paradigm shift, right? You know, you have to evaluate what it is depending on what it is you think the global situation is. Or another example, uh, a train, train ride, and there's a father with three little kids on this train. And the kids are cutting up something awful. They're running around, they're making noise, they're bothering the other passengers, they're just unruly children. And the father is looking out the window, not paying the slightest bit of attention. Finally, a woman on the train is fed up to the teeth and she finally can't take it anymore. And she says to him, can't you control your children? Don't you see they're running around the car causing all this disturbance? And he, he looked at her like out of a dream and said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Their mother died this morning, and they've been really uh, keyed up, and I, my mind was somewhere else. Paradigm shift. Paradigm shift. So you notice in all of those, uh, in all of those situations, a new paradigm came about because the expectations that the person had collided with a fact, with something that became uh, part of what they saw as reality, which they hadn't seen before. And that caused them to have to shift the paradigm. So the question uh, I would propose about Vatican II is, what was the fact that the church ran into that made it need a different paradigm? And I'd suggest three answers to that question. The first is, of course, modernity. That's sort of the big answer. I mean, we tried to tell modernity to go away for a long time, and it didn't, you know. And so by the 1960s, we finally figured we uh, had to, to come to terms with this. And uh, so that's sort of modernity as a whole. But within modernity, there's something that's even more sort of powerful that was the collision which needed to be addressed. And that is the rise of historical consciousness. Uh, in, in the old church, it was really very little a part of historical, historical consciousness was simply not a part of how the uh, material of the faith was thought about or presented. And you know, there are lots of examples of that. You, you might think of artistic representations of the Last Supper that show Jesus wearing a chasuble, giving communion to his disciples who are kneeling and giving him, them hosts on the tongue at the Last Supper. You know, that, that's a lack of historical consciousness. Uh, <laughs> Or the idea in biblical studies, you know, it wasn't until 1948 when Pope Pius XII uh, allowed modern uh, methods of biblical criticism to be used officially that Catholic teachers in seminaries were allowed to say anything else except Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Now, they knew very well that Moses hadn't written the Pentateuch. But they weren't allowed to say that because the fathers of the church had believed that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And of course, that was the teaching of the church and it couldn't change. Things could not change because they were of God. They were true then, they are true now. And historical consciousness meant you began to see this in its context, not as absolute verities, which was how everything tended to be uh, described. And so all doctrines were presumed to be unchanging. And of course, Latin was always spoken and was the sole and eternal tongue of the church. That was one of the pieces of, of self-understanding of Catholicism that had been reinforced 
through the years. Now, of course, we know today what was the original language of the liturgy. Greek. Greek was the language of the liturgy that was used. And why did we change to Latin in the fourth century? Because Latin was the language of the people. That was the language that was being more frequently understood. And so once you know that, and it's not because of, uh, you know, the inscription over the cross uh, was in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, you know, that we're doing Latin today. Uh, we, we made up lots of stories about why things couldn't change, because we just assumed they couldn't change, and then we would find reasons for them, and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, of course, Latin was the language of the Roman Empire, and through the centuries as the modern languages developed, eventually they took the place of Latin in the average uh, expectations of, of con con conversation. Uh, people no longer spoke Latin at home, in the marketplace, at other, stage, uh, other events of life, but in two arenas, they retained Latin, and one was the law courts and one was the church. And eventually the law courts gave it up and finally it was just the church. But it, being eclipsed by a natural process of evolution whereby the Romance and Germanic languages rose and took the place of Latin as a spoken tongue was something, if you understood it historically, it made for a different view of what it was that we were talking about when we saw what the language of the liturgy might be. We began to look as a church at evidence that things had changed in the past and the church had adapted and therefore things could change again, which left one with the alarming task of discerning what is essential and what is not. And this is part of why this was such a challenging time, but also such an exciting time. Because while people were sure that certain things would be essential, it wasn't all up for grabs, discerning what those were, quite a challenge. The third part of what happened to necessitate this new paradigm, I believe, is that the uh, late 19th and early 20th century saw the collapse of empires and of colonialism. Uh, the fall of the German Empire, the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the British Empire, the Ottoman Empire, all of these empires collapsed in the period before Vatican II. And European powers were giving up their colonial possessions, either by force of revolution or by uh, some kind of turnover in response to the cry of the peoples who desired self-determination. You know that it's not a, a crime to say this. The church has always, in some ways, looked to the world around it to see some models of how to express what kind of, of dignity and uh, honor is due to God, and we've used those. So in the ages where there are kings and queens, we have a monarchical idea of how the church is organized. And when there were absolute monarchs and uh, that you had absolute monarchy, ideas going into how we saw the church operating. And so what do we see at Vatican II? You know, the sedia gestatoria, the golden throne, and those uh, crane feather fans that were waved when the Pope went by that were the last vestige of the uh, old Ottoman Empire, uh, that, uh, the Byzantine Empire, pardon me, the Byzantine Empire, those were done away with. It was a time when all around, people were asking questions about who are the people and how do we help people, uh, peoples, whole peoples, to attain their dignity and to uh, live in a way that befits their dignity uh, rather than looking at power and authority in a, domination, uh, in, a, in a manner of domination. So in the midst of all this, the question is, what kind of a church are we going to be? You know, and I think this was the question at Vatican II, that Vatican II implicitly and explicitly addressed. What kind of a church are we going to be? Are we going to have more imperial Catholicism? Are we going to have the Catholic Church as a fortress against the uh, dangers and the evils of the world? And there were some people who, whose answer to that was yes, of course, that Mercurial like that a lot. Uh, but there, there were other images of God, neighbor, and self 
that struggled to find expression and which emerged in the council and thus the paradigm shifted. So just to recap some of the features of this new paradigm, because I'm sure that all of you in this room, you don't spend your life, I hope you don't spend your lives reading Vatican documents. I mean, you have other things to do and, you know, reviewing the council is not, I mean, uh, some of you teach that and so you can, you can certainly, you're going to be very familiar with all this, but just a quick review of some of the things that changed as a whole, Vatican II as a whole. We went from being a perfect society to a pilgrim people, that biblical image of being a pilgrim people. The idea of koinonia or communio, being a communion, uh, from being a pyramid where the authority is arranged that the pope is at the top of the pyramid and the cardinals and the bishops and the clergy and uh, the religious and the lay people are at the bottom and the women are at the bottom, <laughs> lay people. And uh, now, you know, uh, the, 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 this shifted. So communion, koinonia, this uh, way in which the pyramid became a circle. The church it can no longer be something we call them. The church is us. That's a Vatican II paradigm shift. The universal call to holiness no longer was holiness only the preserve of the ordained or the religious, but it was a universal call. And the importance of baptism being raised up at the council underlined and supported this in many different ways. Positive relationships with the outside world were called for. Dialogue, ecumenism, bridge building were to be the way in which we relate to the world rather than the fortress or the empire. And finally, the word of God came into a vital role and much more central to people's lived experience. Um, I, I remember a story, uh, maybe some of you even remember these days when Catholics were not encouraged to read the Bible. Of course, Catholics were always supposed to read the Bible and Pius XII said this, but in fact, at the grassroots level, that wasn't always the case. My mother told me, my grandmother had bought a Bible. She, uh, the salesman came by and she said, oh, a family Bible, this would be very wonderful. And she bought this Bible and the priest at her parish told her, no, you're not supposed to read the Bible. You won't understand it. So being a good Catholic, she closed it up and put it in a trunk and after she died, we found the family Bible. So there we go. Now in the liturgy, uh, the, the paradigm shifted as well. And I'm just going to, to, to briefly say, and some of these are, are in my book, if you want to read about more, it, that's, uh, I, I go through these. The Paschal Mystery was the key theological concept, that liturgy is the summit and source of the church's life, that full, conscious, and active participation was expected of everyone uh, among the faithful. Enculturation was to take the liturgy and adapt it to all of the geniuses of the peoples of the world. Again, that new way of looking at peoples, not as people to be uh, conquered, but riches to be shared and having the liturgy become part of all the cultures of the societies around the globe. And finally, a renewed ecclesiology in which the Eucharist was central. Uh, the, and the priesthood of the faithful stood in a complementary relationship with the ministerial priesthood. Now, in order to realize this new paradigm, the liturgy had to be reformed. And so many of the reforms took place after the council. As I go around the country, I've talked a lot about the council this year, and I found that by and large, what people think the council did actually was part of the reform that took place after the council. Now, I don't think that's a gotcha moment. I mean, sometimes people say, well, that wasn't, that, the vernacular wasn't at the council, but it was after. Uh, I, I think some of these had an organic relationship to what happened at the council. They were being incorporated uh, gradually after the council. But let's just look at some of the things that took place after the council. We came to a fully vernacular liturgy. In the Constitution, it just says that more use of the mother tongue may be permitted and that more permissions could be sought by local authorities if they wished. Well, local authorities wished because gradually it became much more 
uh, desired and much, uh, and the whole liturgy was translated, but that wasn't at the council. It was something after the council that the liturgy became fully vernacular. Communion under both forms on Sunday. Remember, we didn't have that right away. It was only rare occasions when we had communion under both forms. But gradually, at least in the United States, we had it also on weekdays. And then people started to think, gosh, if we could have it on weekdays, why can't we have it on Sundays? And it became something that is done not everywhere, but many places in the United States. Altars facing the people became common. That's not mandated in the Constitution. But even before the Council was over, in the first uh, instruction on the right implementation of Vatican II, inter oikumenici, it says that any new altars and new churches that are built, the altar should be freestanding so that the priest can walk around it and face the people. So permission for that became explicit uh, not soon after the Constitution. Communion in the hand, that was another big step after the Council. New texts were written, new Eucharistic prayers. Obviously, they could not do all these at the council. How many of you have ever been on a committee? <laughs> it was going to take a while to do these things, but they had to be done. And the three-year lectionary was assembled, and of course, more. All of these things happened after the council. So since that time, just to orient you, there have been five instructions on the right implementation of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Three of them were uh, written very soon after the Council itself, inter oikumenici, while the Council was still going on, Tres Abhinc Anos, 1967, and Liturgicae Enstorationes in 1970. Then there were two more, much later, Varietates Legitimae on Enculturation in 1994, and in 2001, Liturgiam Authenticam, on translation issues. We're gonna come back to those, but just to give you the overview. Those later two instructions are quite different from the first three. They're longer, they're more detailed, they're more philosophical, and they're more highly concerned with a disciplinary and centralizing focus. Now, one of the very important paragraphs in the Constitution is Article 38 which urges adaptation of the liturgy to the native genius of the various peoples of the world. Enculturation in Sacrosanctum Concilium was endorsed, but with a single qualification. And that is that the substantial unity of the Roman rite be preserved. Now this raises the question, in what does the unity of the Roman rite consist? Now, 50 years after the promulgation of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, some assert that this unity is textual. Monsignor Andrew Wadsworth, the current uh, executive director of the International Commission on English in the Liturgy, ISIL, said this recently in an article in the Tablet of London. The unity of the Roman rite is now essentially a textual unity. The church permits a certain latitude in the interpretation of the norms that govern the celebration of the liturgy, and hence our unity is essentially textual. We use the same prayers and meditate on the same scriptures. He's, he's actually said this in three different places, so I'm sure he means it. That's, that's what he said. It wasn't an accident, you know. Um, uh, his predecessor, Monsignor Bruce Harbert, although not using the exact uh, e expression, likewise made it clear that one of the central concerns of the new translation of the Roman Missal is to achieve a single text for the order of mass worldwide for the English-speaking world, but also beyond this, because the English text would be used by other language groups as a point of reference to inform and help them in their own translation. And so uh, the English would have ramifications beyond even the uni uni uh, uh, unitary expression among English speakers would have this unifying force beyond that. And, uh, he said the missile will be widely used 
not only in the 11 member countries of ISIL, but in many others where English, though not the first language of the majority of the population, is used in the liturgy, including many countries in Asia, Africa, and Oceania. Thus, the new English Missal will have a career like that of the Missale Romanum, introduced in 1570 after the Council of Trent. He compared the new translation to the 1570 Missal held in the hands of missionaries who also brought bread, wine, chalice, paten, and vestments to the new world. He concluded that Catholic unity achieved through a single text is, quote, bought at a price. That price being evidently diversity. I, I think that's the way one would interpret. Now, if it were just the two executive directors of ISIL who were saying this, you could understand it. If they're interested in the missile, of course they think it's the center of the world. It's like that old joke about someone who goes everywhere to find wisdom, and finally he goes to the top of a mountain, he sees a sage sitting by a pool of water. You know this joke? Say sage, and, and he said, uh, my, my sage, tell me what is the meaning of life? And the sage looks at him and says, my son, life is like a fountain. And he said, but, but great, oh great sage, I've been all over the world. I've been through wars and pestilence and famine. I've been through uh, joys and sorrows and, and all different manner of, of uh, experiences in this world. Life is not like a fountain. And the sage looks up and says, it's not. You know, sort of, but, but now back to this, it, it's not because it's just the missile is their thing. They've got a background for this. They've got a background for this. And we're, here's the background. The uh, general instruction of the Roman Missal in the 2002 edition, uh, these two numbers say this, the Roman rite has acquired a certain supranatural, supra, excuse me, supranational character, and thus the Roman, <laughs> sorry, that's the Roman Missal, quote, must be preserved in the future as an instrument and an outstanding sign of the integrity and unity of the Roman rite. What it means to preserve the Roman Missal is not altogether clear from the text, but it's clear that this is meant to set a curb on adaptation. Uh, liturgium Authenticum in number five also takes this view when it says, in preparing all translations of liturgical books, the greatest care is to be taken to maintain the unity, the identity and unitary expression of the Roman rite. The identity and unitary expression of the Roman rite, not as a sort of historical monument, but rather as a manifestation of the theological realities of ecclesial communion and unity. Ecclesial communion and unity are manifested by, get this straight, the identity and unitary expression of the Roman rite in the Missal, a task furthered by the most exact translation of the Latin Editio Typica. The fourth instruction on the right implementation of Sacrosanctum Concilium, Ver Veritates Legitimae, also says the process of enculturation should, quote, maintain the substantial unity of the Roman rite. That unity is currently expressed in the liturgical books published by the authority of the Supreme Pontiff and in the liturgical books approved by the Episcopal conferences for their areas and confirmed by the Holy See. So here we have the background of these comments. Books, texts, unity. But here's the question, but is the unity of the Roman rite really about having a single text? If Burkhard Neuenhauser, OSB, is to be believed, 
Textual unity was not what the fathers of the council chiefly had in mind when they made the landmark decision to opt for the expression substantial unity rather than formal unity or uniformity when they wrote the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Now, who is Father Neunhauser? Uh, maybe some of you know that name. He was a monk of the, of, of the Maria Lach Abbey. Uh, he died in 2003 after a very long life. He was a very highly respected liturgical scholar. He served as a consultor to the concilium which carried out the liturgical reform. He, like the patron of this uh, lecture series, Godfrey Diekman, counts as one of the elders of the liturgical movement. He taught for many years at Sant'Anselmo in Rome, and those of you who are liturgy students have, have probably seen his name on the works of Odo Cassel, which he edited, for example, another monk from Maria Lach Abbey. And I'd like to uh, quote Neinhauser here because I think he can tell us a little bit about what did they have in mind if it wasn't textual unity. And I think what he has to say is very clarifying and very important. What did the Second Vatican Council have in mind? The council wanted to express, Neunhauser said, uh, to wanted to allow the possibility of legitimate variations and adaptations to meet the needs of different gatherings and peoples, provided that the fundamental unity of the Roman Rite is preserved. Uh, Josef Jungmann SJ interpreted this principle as being in favor of a unity in essential features, along with a vast differentiation in details. Again, we must ask, what are the essential features of the Roman Rite? Certainly, it is not the, lit the Latin language, nor the details of the Ordo Missae, nor the order of the lectionary, the addition of a homily, the intercessions, or other details. It is something much more important and fundamental. And then, I think this is quite striking, he points outside of the liturgy to the goal of the reform, saying, what is essential? It was not the intention of the liturgical reform simply to change the forms and texts, but to implement a pastoral practice, the decisive power of which is placed in it so that the paschal mystery might be ex expressed through living. And this is a quote taken from Inter Oikumenici. So this, uh, he had me right there. This arrested me because, you know, there's a tendency to regard the liturgy as a thing, an object of study, a collection of texts, an archaeological or historical object. But his approach to the unity of the rite was initially to assert its dynamism in relation to the human subject and how this human subject lives in the world. So, so the first thing that is the hallmark of the Roman rite is that the Paschal mystery can be expressed in living because of what the liturgy does. So then, what he's saying is that the essential quality of the Roman rite, its substance, is that it provokes or precipitates or activates the living of the Paschal mystery. You cannot find the essence of the Roman rite in the sacristy. It's not a book. You cannot perceive what is essential to it or preserve what is essential to it without taking into account this dynamic relationship with what's outside the celebration. That is, the life of faith as an immersion in the Paschal mystery. Now, just a word about Paschal Mystery. I've learned the hard way when I've been teaching students that not everybody really knows what the Paschal Mystery is. I always assume everybody knows, and then the, the first papers come back and you find out that no one really had a clue. <laughs> the dying and rising of Christ, the Paschal Mystery, death, resurrection, and glorification of Christ is something which is the Paschal Mystery which we also share. So the Paschal Mystery is something we can also live by entering into the death and resurrection and glorification of Christ in our life of faith. The journey from death to life, that movement of transformation. And I think this is, again, something which is so helpful to meditate upon and think about what does that mean. 
As I listen to Catholics talk about what they want out of worship, I'm sometimes very um, uh, struck by how little they want the Paschal mystery. You know, how little they have a sense uh, or a, a taste for that. Most of what I hear is that people want what I would call the spirituality of the shrine to the divine presence. They want to go somewhere to get in touch with the holy, to touch the mystery of God. And of course, that's not a bad thing. But here's the rub. The spirituality of the shrine can be found in many, if not most, religions. What Rudolf Otto called the Mysterium Tremendum at Fascinans in his classic book, The Idea of the Holy, is an experience that cuts across a wide spectrum of religions. What's distinctively Christian is the Paschal mystery. It's the dying and rising of Jesus. That's the essential thing. Now, there's more to Neunhauser's description of the genius of the Roman Rite than just this. He went on to identify the bone and marrow of the liturgy for which human cultures provide the flesh and blood. So let me continue this quote. The celebration of the liturgy is an actio sacra, the opus Christi sacerdotalis eusque corporis quod est ecclesia acto sacra prelent. Uh, precellenter. How do you like that? And I wasn't even doing a Latin lecture here. This is a sacred action surpassing all others. All this, he goes on to say, I think as described in the, and, and the, and the summit and source, the culmen et font, up. all this I think as described in the Second Vatican Council equally forms part of the genius of the Roman liturgy. It too is preserved more or less in its original state as the heart of the liturgy, I went too far, as the heart of the liturgy even throughout periods of modification and was rediscovered and especially stressed in the post-conciliar reforms. Concretely, I am thinking of the theocentric and Christocentric orientation of worship ad patrem per Christum Dominum in Spirito Sancto, through, to the Father, through the, the Lord Christ, in the Holy Spirit. The anamnesis of the Mysterium Christi, the mystery of Christ, is celebrated in an orderly fashion throughout the liturgical year. Central to it is the Feast of Easter and its weekly celebration on Sunday, the Dies Dominica, Although the memory of the saints also plays uh, a, an important role in the liturgical year, still the feasts of Christ remain more important. The heart of all these different kinds of worship is the Eucharist. The heart of all these different kinds of worship is the Eucharist, the memorial of the death and resurrection of Christ, fulfilled in the communion offering naturally under both species. All this is surrounded by the daily celebration of the Liturgy of the Hours, worthily prayed in veritate temporis. He goes on to say that we must cherish these essential elements of the Roman Rite and adapt ourselves to them, not just in Africa and Asia or Oceania, but in Europe and in the Americas. And finally, he returned to the pastoral goal articulated in the first instruction, even before the council was over, that the paschal mystery might be expressed in living. So you have all these dimensions present in and constitutive to the Roman rite. The dynamic relationship of liturgy to the life of faith, the action of Christ and his body, the church, in the liturgy. Liturgy as summit and source, the Trinitarian character, of prayer, Eucharist at the heart, communion of bread and wine, the ordering of the liturgical calendar culminating in the Paschal feasts, the celebrations of the saints in right order to the mystery of Christ, the prayer of the hours to mark the times and the days. You could have a hundred books, all of them different in the details, but if they did all that, that something much more important and fundamental would be treasured and passed on in them and would therefore be that substantial liturgical unity that marks the Roman rite. Unity was much discussed on the floor of the Second Vatican Council. The question of the language of the liturgy gravitated again and again to the issue of unity. 
how to maintain it, how to assure it, how to express it. Most, uh, many of those who spoke in favor of Latin argued that the vernacular would endanger the unity of the Christian peoples symbolized in the unity of the liturgy. Or perhaps we should say it would endanger the unitary expression of the liturgy, which, as we know historically, only became possible through the advent of the printing press, which happened to coincide with the beginning of the Tridentine era. And yet this had so marked people's imagination that they felt we couldn't lose that un unity by all working from one text. Uh, various people spoke to this, Ruffini, McIntyre, Bakke, and Calavert, all spoke of Latin as a cause and expression of unity, as did others. Uh, an example, unity of faith presupposes one liturgy and one language. Archbishop Armando Fares of Catanzaro argued. Charles Calavert, Bishop of Ghent, called the Latin language the symbol or external sign of unity, as well as, quote, the effective psychological agent of that unity. To these arguments, however, there were passionate rejoinders. Quote, in order to be Christian and Catholic, we are united not by some language, Bishop Franz Simons of Indora, India declared, but, quote, by the worship of one God and Lord, charity, life, sacred scripture, doctrine, governance. Although he concurred with conti the continuing usefulness of Latin for scholarship, he pointed out with, I must say, merciless clarity that Latin was not very well known at the time, and the language which was supposed to unite had actually become a source of division. Division between clergy and laity, between East and West, between the church and our neighbors in the world. Bishop Charles Weber of Linyi, China, pleaded with the fathers to, quote, enlarge your hearts to allow the vernacular. Speaking of the challenges of materialism and atheism in his own land, he concluded that, quote, nothing, even the Latin language, is by itself the bond of unity. Good and bad people will always use language as they wish. Nevertheless, he continued, we have a bond of unity, which is charity. Charity alone is the bond of unity among the people. Bishop Jorge Kemmerer of Posadas, Argentina, speaking on behalf of a group of five South American bishops, observed, quote, the unity of the church is threefold, a unity of governance, of truth, and of charity. This threefold unity can and ought to serve when there are different languages. The source of unity is the Holy Spirit, who overcame the obstacle of linguistic difference at the first Pentecost, and will overcome it in the future, not by a single language, Latin, but by oneness of mind and a heart of love. Bishop Otto Spülbeck of Meissen in East Germany expressed great urgency in adapting the liturgy to the people, making it as accessible as possible, lest it be extinguished by the communist regime, which had made everything in his land difficult about being a Christian. He ended his inter intervention saying, adaptation of the liturgy and active participation among us is a matter of life and death. And there were many other such interventions. The text of the Constitution preserves both an affirmation of the Latin language and a permission for the vernacular according to pastoral use. The use of each is named. Latin is affirmed. The vernacular is permitted. It does not say that Latin is the sign or the means of unity. It does not say anything about a unitary expression of the Roman rite. After the council, the requests for permission to use the vernacular flooded in, as we said before something none of the fathers expected, changing the balance between those first two affirmations, Latin and vernacular, to in being in favor of the mother tongue. Now, 
am I claiming that the same fathers who advocated broader use of the vernacular would have cast a withering glance on the prospect of a literal translation of the Roman Missal? And no one can claim that. The question never arose. They may have, if asked, been on either side of the question of strictness or latitude in translation, variety or sameness in the layout of the liturgical books. But here's the point which the discussion does illustrate. Church unity doesn't depend on unitary expression. If it did, we would still have the liturgy celebrated in Latin for all, entirely. Liturgical unity is a theological concept that was revitalized by the council through the way in which it described what is essential about the liturgy, the essential features of the liturgy described in Sacrosanctum Concilium. This renewed understanding of the liturgy, I believe, is one that is poorly served by an emphasis upon standardization of printed or spoken texts around the world, whether they are vernacular translations or Latin originals. Liturgy is a system of signs, and it is incarnational. As Father Boniface Lux said in Ephemerides Liturgicae in 1964, the scholastic maxim continues to hold true Quid quid recipitur ad modem recipientis recipitur. Whatever is received is received in the mode of the one receiving. Adaptation is essential for reception. And that's true for us as well as it is true for places that were mission territories not long ago. Last of all, I think uh, we need to ask some real questions about the trend toward conceiving the unity of the Roman Rite in terms of one great book, the Roman Missal. By placing so much emphasis on text as a means to unify the liturgy and thus the church, we may paradoxically lose sight of the more important features that unite us and end by actually quenching the spirit. We began by considering what happened at Vatican II as a paradigm shift, one that gives us a new overall view of which organizes the many different pieces of our experience of church. There's a danger that we may interpret facts about liturgy according to the former paradigm, which can't really make sense of them. I am concerned with what Liturgiam Authenticum calls the unitary expression of the Roman Rite because I think that it is actually looking at language within the old paradigm. The very image used by Monsignor Harbert so warmly when he described the missionaries to the New World bringing bread, wine, chalice, patent vestments, and the Roman Missal to evangelize the New World, that image is no longer apt. And Monsignor himself quickly acknowledged that the era of missionary expansion is over. Uh, the, the era of expansion to the new world is past. Yet that was the image. That was the image of what we would do today with this missile, this one book, like the Bible, except that this one comes from Rome and unites us all as one Roman Catholic community. And what's not in the picture, when you think of the Missal in that way, what's not in the picture is that those who have received the word of life through those very missions are now speaking it back to us in new ways. And we are listeners, as well as the ones who announce the message. Not only is this happening in Asia and Africa and Oceania, but we in the Americas are speaking back the truth of life in new ways and unique ways. What we have liturgically in the Roman rite of the council's reform is flexible enough to be the vessel of that life in a global church in a post-colonial world. And it would be a very sad denouement indeed if 
50 years after Vatican II, the Vatican II paradigm were compromised in favor of a new sort of fundamentalism of texts, placing expectations upon texts that render them brittle. Yes, there will be diversity if the Vatican II paradigm, our, artic our articulation of Roman genius, is held and carried out. But there will be unity as well. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much for that lovely presentation. Um, were there, are there any questions you would like to ask, Rita? I can almost see you. Maybe we could get lights up on the audience. Uh, you know, I think you've raised a bundle of issues there. Um, uh, and and uh, something of what you're saying uh, strikes me as a, a good con compare and contrast with what's going on in the church. As Americans, we have great diversity of religious groups, and we have been coping with that with a form of pluralism, which does not aim to have a real unity among anyone, but more to tolerate and be respectful of the varieties that are there. Now, I think with Catholics, at Catholic Christians around the world, we have a, a, some, a, a very different task, and that is to live in, united in Christ and in our confession of faith and in our life of faith together. So uh, the American originals, as you call them, uh, have, uh, I, I think, a part in American culture that would be different from how, indeed, we relate to one another when we're in different communities that have perhaps some diverse, legitimate diversity of liturgical practice. Would you dare comment on how Pope Francis might be influencing the future for us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I'd be happy. I'd be ha I'm, on, I'm on record on the blog already about this, so I have no fear about this. I, I see Pope Francis as being uh, more in the line of, of Paul VI and John Paul II than in the model of his immediate predecessor, Benedict XVI, each of which had a different kind of relationship to liturgy. And um, I see Francis as having some of the courage that Paul VI had to do things that were bold and already, only a few weeks into his pontificate, he's done some things which are quite striking, like washing feet of women and things like that. Nobody expected him to do or thought that he would do. 
And, uh, and like Pope John Paul II, who always reveled in great crowds and in the expressions of native religiosity of the peoples when he would travel, and he certainly had a, a great interest in enculturation of the liturgy. I, I think that will be more of uh, Francis's view rather than seeing one ideal model as being replicated everywhere or setting forth something from uh, the pre-Vatican II tradition as a kind of ideal to aspire to. Uh, there's not an absolute break between pre-Vatican II and Vatican II, of course. All those things that I, I was trying to get at as the, the, the essentials of the Roman liturgy go back and cross those boundaries. But how we celebrate them, I, I kind of see Francis helping us to get uh, to a new place of uh, focusing also See, this is really, I, I think, again, this important connection to what goes on outside the liturgy. I see Francis as being interested more in the human subject and in the ecclesial reality of what the church lives in the world, and that liturgy serves that, rather than being very interested in liturgy as a form which conveys truth by its, you know, uh, uh, very formal characteristics, as Pope Benedict did have a concern that certain forms would not be conducive to the, the strengthening of the people of God. Great question, thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, hear, I hear what you're saying and I affirm what you're saying. I, I think though, you know, that well, Gaudium et Spes says it so well, the document on the church in the modern world, that what we are able to do as Christians is to speak the gospel to the deepest human longings and not to rest content with accommodation you know, I think the word adaptation kind of gets us astray because it seems like we're sort of molding ourselves to what is there rather than being an agent of transformation into uh, the gospel being part of, of life today. And, uh, and I think what Gaudium et Spes says so well is that the same uh, fears and hopes and anxieties and uh, desires of all people are shared by the people of God. And so how does the liturgy enter into that? I think we have a lot of work to do to live the Paschal mystery ourselves, even to own that this life that we've been given is a Paschal life. It involves always dying to self so that something new can, can rise. And, and that's not easy, but that's, if we do that well, I think we do become uh, a good uh, example that others will be drawn to because we're dealing not with trivialities but with the most essential things in life. Uh, you know, so, so I appreciate you ending with that. Do, do we not have to be more rooted in the Paschal mystery than we are? And I would say I believe so. I believe so. Uh, and again, not uh, to there are ways to accommodate to culture that are the uh, parts of culture we shouldn't be accommodating. For example, using the very individualistic approach to worship, that I come to fill my spiritual gas tank on Sunday, you know, rather than to belong to a community or to die and rise or to 
be transformed or to really be in touch with my brothers and sisters in Christ and to live out that social vision that we were talking about last night at the Sundays at the Abbey. So I think you're on to something there. Thank you. Do you think we should have common communion between the different denominations instead of, like, we don't allow Lutherans to receive the Yeah. Well, I think that's an excellent question, and I, I really don't want to answer it. <laughs> because it, it kind of goes way beyond the scope of what uh, the subject is here. Because ecumenism and uh, the way in which we work toward church unity, is Eucharist the, the means to get to unity, or is it the crowning action? I, you know, uh, I, I, it's not that I'm sidestepping, because I don't want to tell you what I think, but I just think it kind of takes us off to another subject. Uh, for myself, the, the Eucharist is the, the culminating uh, act of membership in the church. And so I, I find I, uh, I'm reluctant to uh, celebrate Eucharist together too lightly. However, are there ways we should be able to share Eucharistic uh, worship together when we have achieved a certain degree of union? I, I think is a very open question. Julie. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I'm well aware that there's more than the uh, spoken texts in, in the book. I, I think my concern is uh, that it seems to me you could have the Ghanan missile and the American missile and the missile of Argentina and the missile of Laos and the missile of... And each of these would have some different texts and rubrics and you could still have substantial unity of the Roman Rite, which I know you're not saying you can't, but I just want, I am well aware of that, and I thank you for that lovely example of embodied worship. I think that's so important for us to remember. We're doing things that are kinesthetic, that have to do with the body. Let's not just make it all about the head. Thank you. That is, it seems to me that recently some have been trying to use the Eucharist to enforce political uniformity rather than build true unity of faith. I find that terribly distressing, and I just wonder what your take on that. 
No, thanks. I think that's a, a very important observation and a big concern. It is a big concern. Uh, certainly, uh, our agenda as we gather is to celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. And it's not to forward any polit political uh, agenda or party. Uh, however, uh, I believe that within the body of Christ, we do have people who are engaged and who have strong opinions about uh, how we should vote or what we should do. It simply is a question of pastoral uh, care. How is it that we celebrate the liturgy so that that doesn't inter uh, become a stumbling block to our being able to pray together? Thank you. Let me just affirm that. I think that's wonderful that you're finding wonderful models in other churches. You know, before the council, you wouldn't have been allowed to go into those churches. So. <laughs> and you're not coming out a heretic. Imagine, you know, you just got some great ideas. Uh, and I, I do urge you to talk, talk to your priests, you know, talk to your priests. And don't let those good things die a quiet death within yourself, but talk to the people of your parish. Talk to those who are active in uh, liturgical uh, preparation, the, the music people, the, the, the worship uh, commission, whatever it might be, you know that there, there are some mechanisms for us to share what insights we've gained from that. The other thing is I think this points to the need for ongoing catechesis about the Paschal Mystery as well. When I worked in the parish, I, most recent parish ministry, I used to do the baptismal preparation for uh, uh, infants, parents of infants, and I would always talk with them about how, uh, you know, when you became a parent, you were letting go of something, of your freedom, of your free time, of uh, so many things, so that new life could flourish. And, you know, nobody gets married without having to give up being single, you know, and uh, uh, so on and so forth, that we're living the Paschal Mystery in lots of ways, but we don't even know it. And so it comes about to you know, signify something liturgically. Uh, it helps if we have a notion that this connects with our lived experience too. You know? And how do we celebrate uh, baptism or how do we really bring, and, and perhaps if I might add, you know, even plumb a little bit into your comment or read a little bit into your comment, um, that there may be a, a value in a greater scriptural familiarity and literacy that is a good reminder to us as Catholics to continue to open the sacred text and to be immersed in, in what the word uh, you know, has to tell us and to form us in the word. It's an ongoing task. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. We were just talking about our, there are a lot of things that you can tweak in your own faith community how to, uh, how to celebrate liturgy a little differently, but we still have, dare I say, this straitjacket of documents like the Church of Um I enjoyed a lot of what we got to say here tonight, but if, if we were to move on any of those issues, we can't 
do that ourselves, the church, even though Vatican II says otherwise, is still very hierarchical. Um, what, what can we do? Do we write to the Pope? I'm just wondering, how do we go forward? Well, you know, you raised the $64,000 question, you know. What do you do about this, you know? What do you do about this? I do believe that the first step is to know that something's wrong. And not just to know it in our gut, but to be able to say why this is a mismatch with what was happening at the council. Because that is of greater authority than a document 23 years later interpreting what is the right implementation of, I personally think that Liturgia Mathenicum will be, uh, uh, will, will be reviewed in different light as we go along historically, because it's very strange to have a document that says the right implementation of the Constitution is to do the exact opposite of what you've been doing for the past 40 years. You know, so I think that, that, that we, we have to notice that the emperor's clothes are a little transparent there. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it doesn't mean that we lose all respect for authority in the process. Uh, no, I think, uh, I, I think what happens in a case like this is that you, you have, you know, maybe 10 years worth of sort of building up this new idea that we ought to be having a very narrow, very much this book identical to the Latin as far as possible, even in the syntax and capitalization and punctuation, is going to be the key to unity. And I think we need to keep asking the question of what is really going to unify us and voice it however you can. Now, if it's in your parish, maybe it is a discussion that you have with your you know, parish communities in some way, the worship commission or the parish council or you know, I, in the diocese, maybe there is some forum for this. Now, maybe there is no forum for it. It's still important that the people in this room at least are going to go home and think about that. So thank you.